Tarun and I'm the founder of Juno School of Business. Before this, I founded uh, two popular recruiting platforms, IM Jobs and Hirest. I worked in, you know, engineering, product management. Uh, I did sales, I did marketing. So it kind of, even though those were like six months stints, uh, those those gave me tremendous uh, exposure. Would be, you know, constantly looking for job. And I got, I got interestingly, I got really good at it. And I used to have a massive network of recruiters who would, you know, constantly reach out to me, send me job opportunities that, you know, you know, I would meet friends at party and people would say, you know, there would be conversations around what are the prevailing market salaries, which company is hiring. So I used to be kind of at center of those conversations. And that's how, you know, I am jobs got started. In fact, I used to have a separate email account that I created just to search for jobs. And <laughs> <the> email <laughs> account that I would put on job sites, I would share with recruiters. I would get tons of jobs uh, in that uh, email account. So, so, you know, whenever a friend of mine would ask me for interesting opportunities, I would, you know, just give them the login password of that account. Uh, and I, you know, I would just ask them to go search themselves. And one day I felt, you know, it would be interesting if I put some of those jobs on a blog. And instead of, you know, me sharing login password with all of my friends, you know, anybody who wants to take a look can just go, go look at the jobs and, and apply wherever they want, right? So... Again, the intent of doing all that was not to, you know, build a startup or build a large business or any of that. It seemed like an interesting thing to do. I was just discovering blogs and uh, publishing content online. And so that's how, you know, I'm Jobs, interestingly, he got started. This blog you started, uh, this was like using WordPress uh, and you bought that domain also, I am Jobs, when you started the blog? like No, so it was uh, Joomla. Uh, I don't know what happened to Joomla. Joomla used to be a open source CMS. Uh, and it's not that I researched anything. I, that's what I used. The domain initially was imjobs.in. And it's also a very interesting story. Uh, uh, Again, I I wasn't, the intent was not to build it like a startup. So there wasn't very structured, extremely structured thought process. And there was no, I am job sounded like an interesting cool name. And I felt, you know, that it will be interesting to my, you know, batchmates and friends and so on. There was somebody else who had imjobs.com. Uh, and he was uh, running a recruiting business in Gurgaon. Uh, I, I think he was an IM Calcutta graduate you know, building a recruitment business. And he was also trying to do something similar. Uh, he had a recruiting business. He would push, you know, put some jobs uh, on the platform. So over a period of time, what happened was imjobs.in got popular. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that I used to do was, you know, while I used to get a lot of jobs. And you were still working uh, while it's getting popular. Correct. So I used to work with a company called uh, Rocket Talk. Uh, which again was a very interesting company back in 2008-9, trying to build mobile apps. Uh, early days of mobile internet, you know, on those J Java, Symbian phones and so on. So it's very early. And that was my first exposure to uh, consumer internet and building for consumer internet. Uh, I would only, you know, post jobs that I felt were interesting enough for me or any of my batchmates to apply. Because the idea was not to, I was not optimizing for any metric. Uh, the idea is not to get large number of jobs in the platform. It's a cold side project. And I would put what I find interesting and I had limited time. Which meant that, you know, some of my friends and others would find, would, you know, really find those jobs exciting. And they would, in a lot of cases, find those jobs on other, you know, platforms like Knockery or Monster or Times and Shine. These were firms back then, right? So it kind of started to grow extremely popular on its own. Uh, and uh, I think after about a year, year and a half uh, of me doing it on the site, uh, you know, I used to get a large number of jobs. I used to, you know, stay up. So I, I had a day job, which I would, you know, go to and then come back home, had, you know, early dinner. And then, you know, go back to responding to queries and, you know, posting jobs and so on. So I would stay up 
<laughs> how are you sourcing jobs? Like people were emailing you like... No, so I was already in that network. So I was okay. already in the network. And that's what I had learned, at, you know, those five, six years when I had switched so many jobs. And consultants would, as it got popular, people would, consultants would send me emails and say, hey, can you post it on your, uh, on the other platform? So I wouldn't go out like it's. It, I wouldn't go out and call people and say, hey, "Give me job, I'll post and all that stuff." And I wouldn't care also, right? Because it was just a blog. If one job came that day, I would post. If no job came that day, that was fine. I would go go sleep early. If twenty jobs came, then I had a lot of work to do. But I wouldn't care. I wouldn't measure. It was just a fun thing, and you know that was that. And it got popular. The person who was running IamJobs.com uh, or the person who had the domain IamJobs.com basically was not able to kind of uh, build anything meaningful around. So one day I just sent him email, you know, asking if he would be okay to, you know, give me the domain name. Uh, he was kind enough to do so. He was like, yeah, sure. Uh, there isn't much I am doing with the domain. And if you, if you keep it. So that's how I, interestingly, I to me. Did he sell it to you? Or? Yeah, no, I don't, no, I, I think I had to pay for one year or two year, whatever is the transfer charge. But nothing, uh, nothing meaningful. And back then I didn't have the money also to pay. It was a few thousand bucks, whatever is the transfer fee that the registrar charges. That's all that I paid and uh, and he was kind enough to, you know, offer it. Hmm. Amazing, amazing. So, when did uh, you finally quit your job then? So, I, you know, ran it on the side for a couple of years. I think I quit my job in 2010. Uh, and so, back then, there was no sense of, you know, how do we monetize it? How do we, you know, put a business around it? Uh, would it be sustainable? Uh, you know, how would I pay my bills? So those those questions were still open. Uh, what was, there are two, three things, you know, from my personal standpoint but that happened and that I kind of helped me. The most interesting thing was that, you know, back then there were uh, three or four large job sites backed by big business houses. Right? So, of course, Nokri was extremely large and Nokri was public and uh, was uh, then Monster used to be a very large company in the US and uh, Hindustan Times had just launched Shine around the same time and they launched you know massive budgets and you know advertising all over and, and so on and of course Times of India had uh, Times Jobs and all these platforms were relevant unlike today today only Nokri is relevant Nokia and LinkedIn are relevant. Nobody else is relevant today. And you know what I could see was that all of these companies had deep pockets, spending a lot of money in advertising, large teams, you know, fighting for uh, small shares uh, of market size. And what was happening was that I had a small blog, uh, which I was just updating on the site. I saw that the traffic was growing and, you know, I would meet people and would say, hey, I got a job through your platform or some recruiters interviewed. So I felt that there is obviously something that is working, right? And there is some something that is happening. Obviously, interesting, I didn't quantify, I didn't say, hey, is the market large enough? Ye wo, I don't <laughs> know. There is some value, right? I meet people, I meet my batchmates and they say, this is interesting. Of course, they've heard of Nokri and Monster and all those things. So that was one. The other thing that I felt, you know, I by then I had worked in, you know, seven, eight companies, six, seven years. You know, while, you know, some of the work that I did was interesting. And, you know, I had relationship in the companies that I worked with. Never did it happen that a random person would, you know, meet me, say, hey, I have seen your work and you know, it brings me some meaning. So I'm in a corporate job doing some stuff. You know, every once in a while, the manager would say, "Ha, okay, good job," or somebody else would say, "Ha, okay, job." But it would never happen that you know I would friend of a friend, uh, some 
together and say, oh, acha, you know, I am Jaws, very interesting, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had some money in my account and I felt that, you know, uh, even though I didn't have a sense of, you know, how would we monetize or how do we make a business out of it? If I keep my cost low and if I don't spend much money, I can maybe last uh, three, four years uh, the, the, the savings that I had. Uh, I had the confidence that if I do something for three years, I'll figure it out. I don't know why. Looking back, you know, it doesn't seem like extremely smart decision making. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> but that was the thought process back then. So I, I then, and you know, interestingly, I also back then studied various other classified companies in the US. Uh, Craigslist back then used to be extremely large and popular and dominant. And Craigslist theme all across was to not monetize, right? Or not monetize aggressively. Of course, they monetize and they monetize certain categories, but it's not that the focus is monetization, right? You know, most of those early internet uh, large companies and projects started as, you know, hobby projects and side projects and under monetize. So uh, that theme connected and I felt that yeah, this is also like a hobby project which is taking off and just like regular story and so what if it doesn't get monetized. The other thing was that, you know, other large companies were also were, were, were monetizing in the category Nokri, Monster, everybody else was monetizing it. So, again, the other belief was that if there is the customer is spending money for the offering, right? The customer is spending money in this category. So, if over a period of time we are able to figure out and we are also delivering some value, we don't know, we are not able to quantify the value, but there is some value. That's the reason they are coming back and posting jobs and so on. So, if we can figure out some way to create value, demonstrate value, then some of the spend which is going on, you know, existing large platforms, it will come to us. So that was the thinking back then. And the ambition was not too large. It wasn't like, you know, you know, one had to build a large company or hmm. back, hmm. back then, the, the, the word unicorn was not invented yet. <laughs> the word unicorn was not coined back then. And there was no mention of you know, startups in media or, uh, you know, no, nobody would talk about startups. Nobody would talk about money. Nobody was raising any money. It was extremely hard to raise money. And so, But yeah. you did manage to raise money, right? Like uh, pretty that early happened. on. That happened later. That happened later. Back then, the mission for me was that, you know, I just want to get sustainable. And if I, let's say, work for three years uh, and I bring it to a level, where it generates enough cash flow for me to sustain myself, then it is an interesting project that I can do all my life. And that that was the extent of ambition that I had. He, instead of, you know, a, a shitty corporate job, <laughs> large company, I would much rather, you know, do something that I like and there is meaning people know of. Uh, even if I get 40% of my salary, that's fine. I'm happy to do it all my life. So that, I but think that... when you quit, it was zero revenue, right? Like that you hadn't started anything for monetization. So it was zero revenue for a very long time. Even after quitting for a few, for a few years, it was zero revenue and there was no hope of revenue. So it's not like I'm going to people and I'm pitching and they're saying, nah, if you do this, there will be some revenue. There is no hope of revenue. I'm the only person and I'm not even going out. All I'm doing is I'm just making sure that, you know, I uh, update the platform and... But uh, 2011, you raised the round from Morpheus, right? Uh, so, Samir was the first investor. Morpheus used to run a accelerator program uh, back then. Uh, and those were, again, very early days. There was nobody who was, you know, investing in early stage companies. There were some institutional investors, but they would do late stage deals or those were extremely rare. Uh, uh, so, uh, so Morpheus was our, so Morpheus, Samir used to run this accelerator program, which was very similar to uh, Y Combinator in the US. And, you know, they would, I think, 10, com uh, 10 companies in a batch and, you know, would put in small amount. Like, I 
asking me to put in five lakhs. Uh, so th- that was the first uh, investment that we raised in the company. Uh, that that was extremely valuable, and of course, uh, you know, Samir and Morpheus had an extremely valuable role to play uh, in the company, and and uh, you know, that's a relationship and friendship that I uh, I cherish. So that I mean, now five lakh seems like insignificant. Uh, back then, give me uh, confidence and resources to just hire the first person and you know first engineer number of jobs are growing and those were the high level you know metric that i would look once in a while once in a few weeks or whatever right uh, but it is growing and the number of jobs that i am getting to post every day is is also growing the word is spreading and is popular and that's when we, that's when we raised a small round from morpheus and then at the end of the Morpheus program, they had a roadshow. They had a bunch of, uh, you know, angel investors who would, you know, invest in Morpheus companies. And then uh, uh, in that roadshow, we raised, I think, 80, 85 lakhs. So a couple of interesting things happened around the same time. Anand Lunia, who runs India Quotient, uh, back then he did not incorporate India Quotient. I think he used to work with some other fund but he was an angel investor in fasos uh, and uh, he was hiring for fasos uh, i think jaydeep was hiring for fasos and he posted a job on uh, time jobs and he got a tremendous response uh, so anand and i had not met anand i didn't even know who anand was he found my email id he sent me a mail saying you know you know we have uh, posted some jobs and I am jobs and we like the response and uh, you know if you are thinking of ever raising a round I would want to invest uh, so that's a interesting it happened at the right time and we were kind of in the process of uh, raising some money uh, so Anand invested and this was in uh, 2016 the investment no, no, this is 2000 maybe 12 12 Two years after I, I had quit my job and I had maybe a few months back raised 5 lakhs from Morpheus trying to raise 1 crore, you know, just to, to you know, to kind of scale up the company. And back then, even raising 1 crore was not easy. There wasn't anybody who was saying, ah, take care 1 crore, just because, mm-hmm. you know, you have good... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a different well, ecosystem. <laughs> it was a different yeah. world. And, uh, so, uh, so, Anand invested some money uh, Vijay Shekhar, uh, who of, of course runs Paytm, BSS, BSS uh, invested some money. Uh, Alok Bajpai, who runs Ixigo, uh, put in some, uh, couple of other folks. So, like 10, 12 people each putting 5, 10 lakhs. Uh, uh, and that's how based uh, 85. But that again gave me some resources to you know, hire the first few engineers to build the product, to hire the you know, first salesperson, uh, and you know start building the company. Of course, the brand and the platform was being, you know, but kind of building the companies, uh, the organization and the other aspects, right? So interestingly, you know, when we uh, started reaching out to customers, uh, the brand was already established. So it was never a challenge uh, when the salesperson called uh, a recruitment a recruitment head or recruiter or HR head. They would have heard about IM jobs. In most cases, they would have used the product also, either as a recruiter or as a candidate looking for jobs. Uh, so the brand was established and it was never a challenge to get a meeting. People would say, Haa, ajo, yaar, where were you? You know, we've heard so much about you. Know. <laughs> so some of my early meetings are like, where were you all these years? <laughs> and, 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 you know, those were, those were fun meetings and, you know, I, I used to, I used to, two weeks a month, one week in Mumbai and then 
three four days in that. So interestingly, while everybody had you know heard about IM jobs, used it, uh, so trust and confidence was well established. The fundamental challenge back then was what do we pay for? So he's saying, yeah, job posting is absolutely free. Put in my email ID, and I get applications. So people who are happy with it are happy with it. People who are unhappy are unhappy. Anyways, not buy. <laughs> right. So, so the fun. So the challenge is then how do you monetize? And and you know that brought us to a very difficult product question, which is building a classic platform. And if you have free listings, uh, which which obviously help you become popular and gain traffic and so on so forth. Uh, how do you then monetize? Uh, now one theory is you say now that you know the brand is established, the product is established. Now every listing is a paid listing, which again is a content maybe a wrong call. The discussion kept on happening, and maybe I'm sure it still happens at IM Jobs. Uh, do we discontinue uh, free listings uh, because a large number of people who are you know, getting tremendous value just from free listing. So anyway, so we, so those were interesting times. We launched a bunch of products. So by then, you know, we had never bought or sold recruiting products. I had never seen any recruiting. Like I had never, like I had used Nokri and Monster as a candidate, but I had never seen their recruiting products. So I didn't have a sense of what is the right to build it for monetization. Uh, but, you know, some of those, uh, I used to travel a lot. I used to meet a lot of uh, uh, HR heads and recruitment heads. Just to kind of understand what are the products they are using, what are the challenges they are facing, what is it that we could pay for. And we moved extremely fast on that. We were able to kind of add up customers and revenue really fast. But what were you selling? Like uh, like you said yourself, there was already a free listing. So w- w- what were people paying for? So when there were free listings, people were not paying for anything. Maybe somebody will pay for advertising. Again, that's a tough tough sell. Some people did limited inventory. There is this would be uh, people who wanted more response. Uh, they would pay for an ad on the front page or something this is a interesting employer or like yeah. selling a course or something like an education well, no I mean, somebody would say hey we would do that also uh so, uh, so uh, you know from an advertising standpoint back then uh, so i remember american express launched the card where they were promoting the card only to people from top b schools or top college some something like that they had segmented that we launched a card you know graduate from top school so, so we gave them an ad slot and they would make pay us three, three and a half lakhs a month. Uh, so that covered a lot of our cost for a long time. Uh, courses we launched much later. That's another interesting uh, point, but that happened much later. But there would be, you know, employers and it, it is hard to sell advertising, right? I mean, I, uh, advertising on is performance based and people would look at back then CPC and cost of acquisition and all that. And for a uh, for a blog platform, it's extremely, it's extremely hard to monetize unless you have tremendous we had scale, but like not to uh, not to enough revenue from advertising. And that was very obvious in, from the beginning. There would be certain vendors or employers who would run employer branding campaign. Right? So uh, I remember Credit Suisse had some campaign, Unilever had some campaign. We'd say put this and which they are running on Nokri and other from they say why don't you put it on your site also pay, pay you some money but so what we did was we launched a bunch of products we launched premium listings we had a very interesting product on employer branding we did something around diversity hire we did a product on analytics data analytics so we kind of uh, with that five lakhs you know, our first few sales people started closing accounts starting started adding customers and then we became cash flow positive really fast because our costs were low. And unlike other platforms, we were not spending any money on advertising. 
So our only cost was server cost, which is again insignificant, and then the head cost. Uh, so we became cash flow positive really fast. And, you know, we just went on to flow flowing that money to hire more sales and more engineers and just you know build the product based on the feedback they're getting and you know, find more prospects and more customers and sell sell to them. And that's how we. Scale. Of course, we raised more money in 2016, I think, which is what you were looking at. It was announced. But that's that's how the journey was. This was about, uh, I think, uh, almost $2 billion you raised in 2016. Something like that, yeah. Hmm. What kind of uh, annual revenue run rate were you at by that time? I think maybe 13. I don't remember. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, rough numbers is okay. Just to um, get a broad so estimate. But that um, revenue used to be like super high cost revenue because it's all like high, extremely high cross marks. Okay. Spending anybody, mm-hmm. all we are doing is just we are just creating a login for you. <laughs> That's very high operating leverage as this. Yeah. So, uh, what did you use those funds for then? Why did you raise? I mean, if you had such a high margin. I, looking back, maybe I shouldn't have raised, to be honest. But back then, the thinking was that uh, you were growing. We didn't use any, actually, we didn't use any of those, uh, that money. Uh, looking back, maybe I shouldn't. Well, why do you feel you shouldn't have? What was wrong in it? Like, the dilution is what you regret? That you diluted your state? Or? Because we didn't use the money. Because we didn't use the money, and of course, see the process in itself, the process of raising money is distracting. It's not like I had 10 people coming and saying, here's money, sign this, and something. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, we had to run the process and meet people and pitch and all that, which takes... So, it, the process is distracting. Get new people in the company, and obviously, they have their own ways of... You're accountable to them, then, then they will start asking new set of questions to you. And... So looking back, I felt that there was no need for all that hassle. And I was, you know, the business was self-sustainable. Maybe what could have done was they could have gone to a bank and a line of credit for all that peace of mind. And that was all that was required. Okay. So uh, that one, like from 16 onwards till you sold. Uh, tell me that journey and what led up to the sale. So, 2019 is when we sold the company. Folks at InfoEdge, we, we had known each other for a very long time. Uh, and I have tremendous respect for the company. And we were a small team. And, I mean, we were doing well. Uh, but of course, Nokri had massive distribution and they were work, working with every employer and so on. And which is how it actually panned out. Uh, you know, the business after the acquisition grew many fold, even during COVID. Um, and the brand was established. Not the sales team loved the product and they, you know, started offering it to their existing customers. And there was massive uptake and, uh, and the revenue actually grew many fold. Okay. So, so what was the revenue when you sold? Like, uh, I think we were doing the... 20 crores or so. It's not. We, we didn't have other options. We had a lot of options. Any international player who would look at India market would, you know, in very... Because all analysts were from top schools and they would know I am Jaws. We would invariably, you know, come to us. But I always felt that, uh, you know, of course, money is important. But but the brand has to, be, has to be bigger than each one of us and it has to outlive us. That's our success. Uh, that's our success. Uh, and that's why I felt that it was extremely important for me to understand who is the right partner who can, uh, uh, you know, help scale this brand and, you know, grow the brand further. And and that's why I felt that InfoEdge was a much, much better part. But you did try to go to other markets like high risk, Abdas. We did, yes. We did launch hmm. Hirish. Hirish did, Hirish did well. Hirish was a tech hiring platform Hirish for hiring tech hiring. talent. And, hmm. you know, we would go to employers and uh, uh, people would say, you know, hiring for tech is a challenge. And, of course, that's something that everybody knows. Uh, 
so we said okay theek hai let's in, uh, let's let's uh, use the infrastructure that you know we built for i am jobs we to launch something for the tech hiring space and that's when we launched hirest uh hirest uh, scaled well and it is scaling and again uh, continue to grow but doing uh, but i you know looking back i think we should have probably invested more in hirest uh we till the time of acquisition we didn't have a single person who was focused exclusively on hirest so anything that is happening for i am jobs would happen for hirest we would use the same you know same code base and same tag and everything like it used to be the same and we used to just you know create another instance and uh, use it on hirest our sales team used to be common and because anybody who's selling jobs to any of those customers would also bundle hirest and would get sold uh, so everything was common and we didn't have anybody to focus exclusively on hirest despite that it was growing and it well it's being popular and so on looking back i think i we, you know we could have more resources but you know doing multiple things in a startup is hard uh so one has to find the right balance between focus and uh, you know finding new avenues for growth uh in hindsight of course it is easy to say that maybe we should i should have spent more time maybe i should have hired a couple of more folks maybe you know diverted more money to hire us uh but back then uh, the focus was on job that again we don't want to lose the territory that we won So uh, uh, let's talk about Juno now. So once you sold Lime Jobs to InfoEdge, you joined the group, right? Uh, did you uh, like you know uh, was was it very clear to you that you are here for a short stint and then you start your next venture? No, not really. Actually, when I when we sold the company, I thought you know uh, I would stay longer and you know, we'll kind of scale it up and uh, we'll continue to do what I was doing earlier. and of course uh, covid happened around the same time and i also explored a bunch of other things i made some 30 40 angel investments just to kind of figure out investing is something that i you know enjoyed and wanted to do but i came to the conclusion that i am not a big company guy i don't enjoy uh, you know working in large companies and and you know folks at infage were extremely warm and nice to me all this while i mean at every level not just at the top but every level uh, they were extremely good to me they were also good to the platform brand our customers to employees to everybody guy like you know said earlier it was a very very well managed well assessed transaction but personally i felt that you know i didn't enjoy being part of larger company and you know i missed the early days of you know being a startup and you know figuring out things that i like i said i tried investing in a bunch of uh, startups and i felt that i didn't like in investing either i just i just couldn't sit through you know presentation <laughs> i i didn't enjoy it at all uh, and, uh, so that's when i kind of thought the time is right and it's better to kind of go back to uh what i what i liked and what i enjoyed doing and then so you know started to work on junus and what was the uh, like tell me about the birth of the idea you know what what made you want to do this so basically uh, you know we hired a lot of people in sales in i am jobs we used to have a large team because we had to sell to enterprise customers and we had a large distributed team right so we had, initially we had folks in delhi then we set up offices in every major city uh, mumbai bangalore hyderabad chennai pune all and we used to have there so i spent a lot of time and anybody that we hired in our sales team in i am jobs i uh because i felt that you know uh, they represent the brand and they represent but then they represent me in some way uh, so i had to be totally comfortable with whoever is representing 
you know, I am jobs in front of the customer. Right? So I interviewed thousands of people for, you know, uh, for uh, for sales roles in, in IM. There are two or three things that, you know, I learned in the process. Uh, one thing was, you know, you know, while there are a large number of people into a sales role, nobody actually goes through a structured formal sales training program. It's just not part of our education system. For some reason, it is just, I don't know why. There are so many people who are selling. Uh, and there is no school, there is no university, there is nobody who's offering a sales course. People who do, who go to B school and do their MBA, you know, they have courses for marketing, people, you know, read Kotler and 4P and all that stuff, right? Uh, or even if, you know, there are courses in sales, those are leadership courses, channel management courses, stuff that people would do 10, 15, 20 years down the line in their career, right? But nobody is saying, you know, hey, if you're an enterprise salesperson or even if you're selling sales, this is how, this is the structured sales training. Nobody goes through that. That is why. In fact, go to the extent of saying that our education system does a terrible job of positioning sales as a career. Most people in our society, for whatever reason, I don't know why it doesn't make sense to me as an entrepreneur, look down upon sales as a career choice. Yeah, and that's why there are no sales courses also. No? I mean, NIS try, was an attempt by NIT to do that, but uh, I don't think they could scale because the demand was not there. No, the demand was there and NIS is actually a massive brand. It's, you talk to people, every, like anybody I speak to, everybody says NIS. Top of the mind, super brand. Right? But those were different times and they were building physical centers and so on and so forth. You know, I feel that Actually, not there are a large number of people who are in sales roles. People who are not in sales roles also need to have sales skills. And everybody is selling all the time. Right from the CEO uh, or folks in other functions, right? You need to be able to build relationships. You need to be able to communicate. You need to be able to listen. You need to be able to ask the right question. You need to be able to pitch what is it that you are proposing. You have to follow up, irrespective of whether you are in HR, you are in product, you are in marketing, you are in finance. So I feel, I extremely strongly feel that everybody, just the way everybody should financially literate, just the way everybody should be able to speak and write well, just the way everybody should be able, should have basic maths, understanding of maths, everybody needs to know sales. So that that's that has been thought process for people in the, like in IM jobs, you know, we used to hire people literally also. And then we came to the conclusion that, you know, most people come with the baggage from the type of industries and companies that they've sold in. They, so they don't have formal uh, sales training. And along with that, they have baggage on the basis of who their manager was, who their lead was, you know, they would try to sell. Uh, in that way uh, so we, we in IIM job came to the conclusion that it is actually better to hire freshers and to, um, and put them through a one, one two month training uh, training and we found that it was scalable and so on uh, you know people turned out to be to be great you know in our case they were selling topmost level you know, people that recruitment had HR had in large companies and they were able to kind of do so so that was the learning and insight, which, uh, you know, I started to know school. Uh, the idea is, that, uh, you know, for folks early in their career, whether they are in sales or not in sales, should go through a two-month structured sales training program. Uh, again, sales, of course, you need to understand the fundamentals. You need to have structured framework. But also there has to be a significant experiential learning for you to be so you have you so you don't learn by framework you learn by experience right so you do things uh, there is emphasis on role plays uh, assignments there are projects observation right. shadow yeah, yeah. You, you can't learn sales from books 
I mean, of course, books books are valuable, and you 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 need to have the basic framework. Uh, but if, let's say if I have to turn to make a page, then I need some mentor who listens to my page and says, "Hey, these are the mistakes that you're doing." Right? Or if I am in a sales conversation, I want some mentor who tells me, "These are the questions that you should have asked." Right? Or why did you interject at this point? When the prospect is speaking, you let him speak, right? So these are the fundamentals. While you know, you you could read it in a book that you know, you should you should listen more than you speak, for example. Right? Well, it doesn't register, right? But when you do it two three times with a trainer and somebody says, "Hey, this is the field," then you know that's the way to learn sales, and that's what we are trying to do with Junos. Okay. So, uh, what is the way in which you're doing this? Is it an online course? Is it like do you have like a campus and these are like, uh, is it like a uh, like a postgraduate diploma kind of a course or what? What is it like? No, it's a fully right now. It's a fully online program, uh, and like all the conversation, all the discussions, all meetings, everything happens. Uh, Like I mentioned, sales is a life skill. Everybody should do it. Why should we put barriers and restriction on who and who cannot learn sales? That everybody is, you know, most welcome and 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 should do that. We are just getting started. I feel that you know, as we grow, we will see sales in itself is fairly specialized across industry, right? So the way enterprise software is sold. is different from the way real estate is sold is different from other consumer products and so on so forth right so while you know we're just getting started i feel as we scale makes sense to actually specialize have specialized courses across industry level and so on so forth but right now we're doing one program which is a two month program uh, which is online happens early morning or uh evenings and then we bring in we invite people from the industry you know spend time and uh talk about best practices interestingly uh, uh you know the technology has so many tools makes the job of a sales person so much easier uh to today hire and you know talk to most people won't be aware right so again so just the way you for example have labs in an engineering college you know you know we have the same construct where we say hey these are the tools that every sales person should okay so like linkedin uh, sales navigator for example you know them like crm for example is basic linkedin sales nav- sales navigator uh, then there are lot of tools that help you prospect there are tools that for example uh, help you send the right emails uh, are your mails being read or not uh, how do you send the pricing quotation so like tons of tools which are available in the in in, in the market uh, that most people are not exposed to and i feel that you know that would help them be, be more employable and do much better in their sales career mm-hmm. so you you have like a collaboration with the companies behind these tools so to kind of let the students get a experience of it so we we in we you know we invite experts and uh, you know, they kind of demo the product show the product we have sessions uh, see most of these products are free to register for consumers right 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 there'll be a trial period and all that premium yeah, model then nobody yeah. stops you from actually mm. registering on linkedin sales navigator for a month and 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 use the same for sales for same for any other seo so we don't have those collaborations today but i think those are not very hard to do and as we scale up kind of and uh, so what is the uh, cohort for this is it like people who are already doing sales so uh, Uh, there are two three type of people that we get to see uh, in the cohorts uh, one is folks who have three two to five years of experience in sales who are self 
and who know that this is a gap they want they think they think that for the right path they want to pursue and you know do better on, on you know in a in, in in the sales role that they are in but they also feel that they don't have the adequate skills and they want to acquire those skills that's one large cohort uh, the other uh, is there are a lot of small business owners who feel that you know uh, they can do much better uh, if they uh, have better sales skills uh, interestingly business owners for us is a is a smaller cohort but it, it's another segment that uh, we seeing of interest from then the third is people who are not in a sales role who are either in adjacent roles or people who are like not related to sales at all but feel that you know these are things that they should anyways know uh, that's also another inter- i mean though these two are smaller segment the larger segment is of course people who are already in sales and self aware and want to do better so do you also plan uh, a b2b uh, version of it like where you for example would go to nokri.com and run a sales training program for their uh, uh, sales team and things like that see the thing with b2b is then it and you end up uh, customizing it and it doesn't stay a product right so for example if i go to a company that has a large sales team they'll say, like people like all large companies actually engage with uh, training training companies and freelancers you know who help from a sales training stand but the level of customization that is required is extremely high right so then you end up being in a services business which doesn't scale and so on, right uh, so the idea here is to not become a consulting firm a training consulting firm but create a defined and a product that we can offer at scale now some employer comes to us and says hey one of our guys this program and we really liked it can you give us 30 more the answer to that is yes but with no customization as is because they are more welcome to join the program but but the see it's the same problem in im jobs also when we started selling im jobs people used to say hey can you hire for us of course we can hire but then we end up become a recruitment agency right which doesn't scale and is a different model and so on so we are very clear we are a product business we want to build our brand we want to scale the product so that we can offer it to a large number of customers right so just the isb also offers programs to companies but it's a brand right so we want juno to be the brand and offer courses which can be offered at scale to a large number so what is the product journey so far what what have you built as as a product here like what of course would be like a video conferencing part of it for the classes what else is there so we are extremely early in the process and it's been a few months a few few quarters and i feel that we are still at a stage where we are figuring out the right value proposition for our customers see building a product is easy once you know what you have to do you can build that right and building a lms or a workflow product i mean is 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 fair easy now is a solved problem right the harder problem is is to say hey what is the what is the curriculum that we should offer right that we could offer what is the right duration what is the right curriculum in that duration that a create some meaningful impact in the life of person who is actually taking the program right if i go through your program for two months like do i actually become a better sales person right or if i am not in sales do i acquire certain skills that help me uh, that help me do better in whatever i am doing so i think right now we are at, on a journey and then it has to be uh, done in a way that it is easier to sell right so it has to be meaningful to the person who is buying but at the same time uh, it has to be packaged and priced in a way uh that it is easier to sell and then you figure out what is the right go to market and so on. so i think uh, we are at a stage where you know we are trying to identify that offering and value proposition 
before we start writing software. Okay, makes sense. Okay, and what have you priced it at? So right now it is priced at ten thousand rupees. Hmm. Okay, which is pretty reasonable. Which is uh, low price. I mean, of course, we, we are at a stage where we have we just put a number and we say, okay, let's see what is the uptake. We don't know when. See, if I were to think about it in terms of value that is being delivered, of course, it is maybe ten times the value that is being delivered. But the harder problem at this stage is to demonstrate value. Yeah. If what is and figure out what is the right price point that the market buy. What is the way to demonstrate value? Is it through salary increases, like jobs? Is it a job oriented course? No, no. So we are very clear. That uh, we don't promise jobs. We are not a recruitment business. वो कर लिया मैंने। I am not building a recruitment company now. So <laughs> see, again coming back to the same discussion we had earlier, right? See, if I start promising jobs, I will have millions of people outside my door tomorrow morning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, ten thousand. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. At any mm-hmm. price, right? Even at one lakh, I'll get right lot of interest. Right? But the point is, are you able to deliver on that promise consistently? Uh, so our view is very clear. We are not promising jobs. We are promising education and skill set. And if we do a good job of teaching you sales, then finding a job is not hard. See, finding a job is also a sales process. You have to prospect. You have to create the list of companies that you're interested in. Then you have to find the right people in those companies. Reach out to them. Then you have to say, "Yeah, I am person because this is the experience that I have." And then you have to try to close. So finding a job for a good salesperson is actually uh, is is fairly trivial. Uh, so our view is very clear. We we are not a recruitment company. We don't promise jobs. we promise good education we promise skill building and hopefully that should translate into a great career for you we are extremely clear that this is the path and is this uh, like a, a cohort based learning like you have like say a batch of 50 kids yeah. and they learn together with lot of peer uh, activities and group activity like how an mba is is it like a similar approach it's actually better than mba Please, the MBA that I did. Of course, it is not residential, but there is a cohort of forty learners, which is extremely interactive, and there's a bunch of you know projects and and, and role plays are extremely important in sales. So people do all give feedback to each other. Trainers give feedback. That's some of these skills get. And how many kids have you uh, like trained so far? How many students? I think we have about seventeen, eighteen hundred learners so far. Again, it's very early. Like the market is huge. There's so many people. Like everybody should learn sales. I feel it's like it's near zero. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. So, what's your advice to? uh young professionals who are thinking about entrepreneurship so uh, my advice to them would be acquire skills focus on skills uh, take up roles where you get to learn your skills right learn to sell learn right code uh, learn marketing do all that uh Keep your personal cost low. I haven't seen a lot of people get successful in a year or two. I mean, of course, some people win lottery tickets. And sure, you can you know you can pinpoint and say, "Ha ha, got successful in six months." But of all the people that I know in my net, and you know, people I started with and so on, and it's much easier to raise money now. Uh, but my advice to 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 people. Thinking of starting up, uh, save money, keep your cost low, acquire skills. 